viewer from Portland, Maine. Mark is on the phone, also on the Republican line. Go ahead, Mark. Thanks for taking my call. Just uh, wanted to make a comment in response to a call that came in short time ago. A uh, caller was talking about how candidate Ron Paul was dangerous because of his views that uh, we should, uh, you know, not interfere with foreign countries to a certain extent. She was making reference to September 11th, and it's very important, I believe, for people, uh, all stripes, sizes, and colors, Democrat, Republican, whoever, to... Thanks very much for the call. Appreciate your calls and comments. Uh, coming up in just a couple minutes, Congressman Ron Paul at the Soapbox, sponsored by the Des Moines Register. At Politico.com, the story next up for Mitt Romney is Rick Perry. Jonathan Martin is the co-author of the piece. He's joining us live from Des Moines. Thanks, as always, for being with us. Hey, Steve. How are you? First of all, where physically are you in Iowa? I am on the way to Indianola, uh, Iowa. Steve, uh, to famous to your listeners as home of the Harkin Steak Fry. Uh, but today is actually where Michelle Bachman is going to be hosting a town hall meeting. She's doing a flurry of, of events today before tomorrow's Amos Draw Poll in an attempt to really turn out voters from central Iowa who you know, live within about a half an hour to an hour drive of the Straw Poll site. And Jonathan Martin coming up in just a moment. Congressman Ron Paul is about to speak, so we're going to listen in to him, and if it's possible, Great. we'll check in with you in about 20 minutes. Thank, thank you very much. I'm glad you're out this morning. But I'm just wondering, how many will be in Ames tomorrow? Yes. Hey, that looks good. Maybe we can get a few more of you to come, too, as well. But, uh, of course, uh, I think most people know why uh, candidates are in Iowa this week and what's going on tomorrow. But it's delightful to be here and attending the fair. And also, I'm sort of enjoying the weather as well, having come from Texas here just recently. But, it's, but it is great to be here. But, of course, uh, the real thing that uh, motivates me is the issues that uh, I think have been messed up in our country and that we have to change our way, we have to change our direction. The American people are pretty tired of what they're getting. They know their serious problem. There's a lot of anger going on and frustration, a lot of unemployment. And uh, somebody has to come up with some answers. Well, you know, a few years back uh, in the 1970s, I first ran for Congress, and I was pretty concerned about what was happening then. I believe the stage was set for the kind of problems that we have today, and it happened back in uh, August of 1971. That was at the time that we decided that money didn't matter. We can print the money. There should be no, nothing to back our currency. We'll just print the money, and we can live happily ever after. That means that we believe, as a people, that if we could just counterfeit our own money, we could live and not have to work anymore. What did we end up with? A huge amount of debt. We owe $3 trillion to foreigners. Our good jobs have gone overseas, and now we're deeply in debt, and there's a debt burden, and they're very, very frustrated in Washington, which makes it very frustrating for the people across the country. A lot of people have become dependent on the government, and we're doing way too much. So my simplest explanation of our solution is we have to drastically shrink the size of our federal government. Most people are starting to realize this, but the big argument is, where are we going to shrink it? But, you know, people say, well, well you need not bipartisanship, and you need compromise and sacrifice. My argument is we've had too much bipartisanship, because it's the bipartisanship that we've had that have endorsed all our problems. If we elect Republicans to shrink the size of government, they go and double the size of the Department of Education and get us involved in a bunch of wars. So we elect the Democrats who are, say they will end the wars, and they expand the wars. And then we have uh, re Republicans that uh, expand the budget, and Democrats are doing the same thing. So there's always this compromise. There are the big spending conservatives and the big spending liberals. They get together, and they don't have to worry on the short run. They can always delay it. Sure, you can tax to a degree, but there's a limit to how much you can tax. You can borrow to a degree, but if you borrow too much, interest rates go up. But there's a magic, magic answer to this. It's called Keynesian economics. It's called fiat money. Oh, the miracle pill is that you just print the money when you need it. And that's what 1971 was all about. No restraints on the monetary authority. And all our problems in the last 40 years came from the fact that big government is subsidized and taken care of by the printing press of money. 
But right now, the American people have awakened and they're starting to realize it has a lot to do with our monetary system. They know that prices go up when the value of the money goes down and they're not very happy about it because the standard of living goes down. People can make a little more money and the checks can go out, but if the, standard, if the money value goes down, the standard of living goes down, that's one of the reasons that people are very, very upset. And the people on retirements, people who are getting Social Security are starting to recognize this. And the tragedy here is that the production in this country is down. The productive jobs have gone overseas because of this monetary system and over-regulation and over-taxation. So we chase our jobs overseas. In order to get capital back in, you have to have a strong currency. You have to have a tax code and a regulatory code that invites our businesses back rather than chasing these businesses overseas. So it's sort of sad to me to think that in my lifetime, we saw a point where there was a, 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 a country called Communist China evolve into being our banker. There's something about that, and we should reverse that, but we have to endorse a very basic principle, and that's called freedom and the Constitution. But since it was bipartisanship that uh, got together and spent all the money, how do you get out of this mess? How do you get people to agree to cut spending? And that's where the difficulty is, and there's no agreement in Washington. So what I do, what I have uh, done is I've tried to propose a way to try to get the two sides to come together. But I think the area that, that we could most easily cut is what we spend overseas. We spend way too much overseas. We have an American empire overseas. We spend trillions of dollars. We're obligated to spend trillions of dollars taking care of the seriously wounded and injured individuals coming back home, which we're obligated to do. And we pass out all this foreign aid, and it's all supposed to be for national security. All this militarism doesn't help us. It doesn't make us secure. People won't vote against it because if you vote against a military budget, not realizing all you're doing is uh, giving subsidies to the military industrial complex, they claim and they accuse you of being un-American and not caring about the military. I'll tell you what, that's the way I've been voting and I'm very proud of one thing. During this campaign and the last campaign, our campaign always raised the most money from the military people more than all the other candidates put together. And having served in the military, I was drafted in 1962. I was in the Air Force for uh, five years. So I understand a little bit what it's like to have a bad war going on and people being sent around the world and ending up with no-win wars. So I've been very conscious of that. But we're, we should be able to defend a non-intervention foreign policy just on principle, moral principle, that you don't start wars, you don't initiate wars, you don't fight unless it's, a, it's a constitutionally declared. So it's a very simple answer as far as I'm concerned about how to start off by saving a lot of money, and that is have non-intervention, stay out of the business of these other countries, mind our own business, and bring all our troops home. That means the, the Middle East, Japan, Germany, South Korea, the whole works. Because that, if you do that one thing instantaneously and the president does have the authority to move the troops around, that means bring the troops home. If they're going to get paid all this money, let them spend the money here rather than in Japan and Germany. So that, it just psychologically, it would give a tremendous boost to, to our economy. But you have to change a lot more than that. You have to change the nature of what the people want. The appetite for big government government has been around for a long time. There's a lot of blame to go around. You can blame our presidents. You can blame our congresses. You can blame, uh, you, you can blame bad philosophy, the, uh, the philosophy of economic intervention. But you also have to look to the people. How many people ask their congressmen, I want you to vote for this. I want you to vote for this. We're having some difficulty with our live coverage of uh, Congressman Ron Paul at the State Fair in Iowa. We'll continue to listen in. And a reminder, you can get more information by logging onto our website.